Hi, I'm Jeffrey Wang, Chief Architect at Amplitude. Today, we're going to be talking about data platforms, what purpose they serve, and what we see in the industry in terms of build versus buy, especially the increasing prevalence of in-house data platforms at both tech and non-tech companies. So first up, what is a data platform? So we consider the data platform a central hub that controls the flow of information within your broader data ecosystem. So some of the key components of a data ecosystem include your data warehouse, something like Redshift or Snowflake, a data lake, which will consider things like Amazon S3, and then numerous third-party tools that you likely integrate with. So the data hub serves, a uh, data platform serves an important purpose, which is to be the hub for data flowing through this system. So even though SaaS is becoming an increasingly well-adopted pattern, uh, we're seeing a lot of companies build data platforms in-house. We'll talk a little bit about why. So even though it's a bunch of work and requires a data engineering team to do properly, uh, it's becoming a necessary muscle for the digital enterprise. And some of the biggest reasons that we see are one, consistency of data, two, privacy, and three, enrichment. I'll talk about each of these a little bit in the abstract before we go into a little bit more practical information about building data platforms. So first up is consistency. Uh, as I'm sure we all know, data inconsistency is one of the biggest banes of data-driven decision-making. The only way to really get a handle on this problem is to establish what we call a source of truth. So that's one place where you know the data going through that is correct, and you can reconcile against that. If you have data kind of flowing arbitrarily between your systems, uh, there's kind of no hope for debugging inconsistency because you don't even know what's correct. Even with a data platform, uh, you still have some pretty hard problems because downstream data systems may not reflect the same information as the source of truth, and you still have to go debug those. You know, one of the things we see is that you will inevitably have to work on debugging issues like why is data in X different from data in Y? And we think engineering level visibility into the source of truth is kind of the key to solving that. So we've seen too many cases of this happening to, to be naive enough to think it won't. And one of the complexities, for example, that really justifies that engineering level visibility is the idea of error handling and how core it is to you know, replicating data and moving it around. If you have your data systems kind of moving data between each other, uh, you likely don't have very good visibility into the errors that are happening, why they're happening, what the implications they are in terms of data consistency. And so the teams that we see who kind of embrace the complexity instead of trying to offload it and bring it into their data platform are by far the most successful in ensuring data consistency. And so having the source of truth and more importantly, having your data slash engineering team actually be able to see what's going on in there, look at the errors, um, resolve inconsistencies, is what leads to a successful and consistent data ecosystem. So second up is privacy. You know, with the privacy is becoming a more and more uh, important topic for everyone building data systems uh, with the, you know, with laws like GDPR in Europe, CCPA in California, uh, and the list is gonna go on. It's really a nightmare to not have you know, fine-grained control of what data is flowing where in your entire data ecosystem. And so given the, you know, the complexity of this problem, as well as the risk involved uh, in terms of uh, the laws, we recommend that people implement privacy as part of the data platform. And this is because it's better to have a proactive approach where you kind of force everyone to say, okay, the data that's going out, I have decided that this is not personally identifiable information, PII, and it's okay to flow into the downstream data system. You know, we used to be pretty uh, okay with retroactively verifying that type of stuff, um, but you know, given the penalties around the laws and all of that, uh, it's much safer to do it this way. And because of laws like GDPR, which force you to essentially have programmatic connections to all of your data systems, uh, you know, in case a user requests a deletion or uh, requests their data, 
that programmatic connection is actually one of the fundamental pieces of the data platform anyway. And so, you know, the combination of the privacy environment that's going on in the world and the fact that you want to have this fine grained control means incorporating privacy and having a data platform that you control makes a lot of sense. Cool. And the very final point on enrichment uh, is probably the most complicated and uh, important one. So when I talk about enrichment, I mean there are often a lot of out of band uh, pieces of information that you want to incorporate with the data flowing through your data platform. So for example, for a, a, you know, a company, it might be you know, their customer subscription status or uh, you know, product catalog information or uh, you know, affiliate revenue. All these types of things are really important information that come from a different place than you know, the normal data flow through your data platform. And enriching it is a key part of making that data actually valuable. You know, if you, if you don't have that enriched information, the data can be wrong, it can be incomplete, or, or it can just be useless. And so enrichment is a really key piece. So it's a little bit different from inconsistency um, in that it touches upon like a very tough topic within data systems, which is mutability. Uh, and the reason is that enriched data, so we'll, we'll kind of draw them all down here. We'll, we'll call these enrichment DBs. Um, and they're kind of abstract, don't worry if they're actually databases or not. The point is you probably have a bunch of internal systems that are responsible for providing enriched data. Uh, and so to the point on mutability, these enrichment DBs, one of the key properties of them is that they often don't have the information ready in real time. Um, you know, when I talked about you know, affiliate revenue or subscription status, those things often update asynchronously at different frequencies. And that's a key point that causes it that makes it difficult for the downstream systems to reflect the most accurate state. Because these systems don't often support mutability well, the ability to change the data afterwards, um, and they don't support it because it's a very hard problem, uh, it can be really tricky to deal with updates to your enrichment databases and their implications on downstream data systems. So as an example, you know, let's say you have you know, multiple DBs that update at different frequencies, so like minutely, hourly, daily, it's actually a business decision to decide how data should be flowing to each of these data systems with respect to the enrichment. So in some cases, you might care mostly about real-time monitoring. In that case, maybe you actually don't need the latest you know, enriched data and you're okay with you know, one day old because all you care about is, you know, is the site working, is the app working. On the flip side, you might be doing you know, revenue analysis uh, that, in that case, accuracy is much more important than real time. And so you might be willing to wait you know, a day for your enrichment DBs to update, provide the correct enriched data to your data warehouse, maybe where you're doing the revenue analysis. The point is, they all are kind of business decisions to decide what level of enrichment is right for you to do. And if you try to offload this concept of enrichment to like some data platform that you don't control, it becomes very difficult to get the right trade-off for all of your use cases. Okay, so these three reasons, consistency, privacy, and enrichment are the primary uh, drivers for people building uh, data platforms. And you know, they're often missed in the initial design or evaluation of you know, a project to build data platforms. And that's because they're pretty subtle. Uh, but if you stay on top of these and are thinking about them, uh, you'll definitely be a lot more successful. Okay, so in terms of data platforms, like how do we, you know, how do customers, how do companies actually build these? So the most common thing we see uh, in terms of technologies to build the data platform are on our uh, queuing system. Queuing, sorry. Uh, something like Kafka, uh, a data warehouse, something like Snowflake, or a data lake. something like S3. So you, meant, you might notice that we mentioned two of these earlier as part of the data ecosystem. Uh, and, that, and that's one important point. Like sometimes your data lake or your data warehouse, they are the data platform and that kind of saves you one extra node. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons to kind of choose each of these and they have a bunch of different trade-offs uh, that I can't go into all the details on, but you know, they, they differ in terms of cost, how real-time they are, uh, how much inspection you can have into each of them. And so it's kind of important to evaluate a little bit uh, about your use case and what's important to your system. 
It's also the case that you know, these three are all very widely adopted uh, strategies for managing data platforms. And so you can't necessarily go wrong. Uh, they're all well supported and understood. Cool, so that's kind of the, the basis of how people build data platforms. Uh, and a lot of the work comes in you know, incorporating you know, privacy, enrichment, you know, working through all those processes. All right, and then the very last point that I want to talk about is uh, there are a number of third-party uh, data platforms that you can use, uh, but we're kind of seeing people uh, generally migrate away from that or have their own systems as well. And one of the reasons is that even if you have a third-party data platform, it's really hard to avoid having some internal system that is very similar to a data platform. And you know, enrichment databases is a great example of this. Because the enrichment databases are all of these complex internal uh, custom systems, it can be very difficult for a third-party data platform to really understand what's going on uh, with your systems. And so you might need something internally to manage it anyway. If you have both an internal and a third-party data platform, you end up with uh, kind of a, a regression along the source of truth problem. You now have two places which sort of act each as their own little source of truth, and they can be inconsistent with respect to each other, and that's a big problem. And so my recommendation is, unless you can get away from having an internal system at all, like maybe your architecture is a little bit simpler, uh, then you, you may as well invest in this data platform because all of these uh, points are really difficult to achieve and important to invest engineering effort in, um, and you can't really avoid the problem. Uh, and it's kind of really key to setting up your whole data ecosystem for success. All right, so that's it on data platforms. Thanks.